your own experiences please really really welcome we'll feed them into the conversation with martin berry who's here from the college of paramedics and jonathan fox who is a serving paramedic he now works for a private company he spent 35 years on the front line and in our dunstable studio this morning is matthew westhorpe who is a former frontline paramedic who now works as a clinical advisor for the nhs emergency service 111 good morning gentlemen martin what's your theory as to why emergency response times are going up it's, not, it's more complicated than simply the fact that ambulance services are dealing with more and more patients. This is a, a huge number of different aspects that are affecting this raise in demand and a change in demand. Modern ambulance services and modern paramedics are having to deal with more complex patients. They're having to manage patients that they wouldn't historically have been managing before. And with the pressures on other community services and organisations such as A&Es, GP services, mental health services, the pressure is building up and up and up. And a lot of these people are turning to the ambulance service where before they probably wouldn't have. Right. And this is adding to the historical problems of just working harder, working faster, and we've got to the point where we simply can't do any more with the current capacity. Would you agree with that assessment, I would. Jonathan? Things have changed radically since I first joined in 1978. And part of the problem is that for a lot of people, they can't distinguish between an emergency and what is an inconvenience. And people all see the, also see the ambulance service as a convenient access point to the so healthcare system. Give us an example of an emergency when it would be right to ring 999 and an inconvenience when people shouldn't be ringing 999 but still do. Somebody has got a severe asthma attack and can't talk during the period that they're having the attack. And somebody has got an allergic reaction, which is simply a simple rash and the difference between the two can make, make the difference between life and death if there aren't enough resources available to actually send ambulances to those in most need most quickly. Mm. Uh, Matthew in Dunstable, uh, what is your own assessment of why response times have gone up so much? Well, it's not a new phenomenon. This is something we've been seeing occurring over a number of years now and uh, I believe that the ambulance service is essentially the canary in the coal mine of the wider NHS malaise. It's, uh, the ambulance service is under increasing pressure because of closed A&Es, because of uh, under-resourcing and the, the staff can only be pushed so hard and for so long before they do become broken. Uh, I wanted to put to you what the Department of Health say. Ambulance services in England continue to perform well under pressure, completing 3,400 more emergency journeys every day compared to six years ago and responding to the significant majority of the most serious calls within eight minutes. We're easing that pressure by helping to recruit 2,200 more paramedics since 2010, as well as increasing the number of training places this year by 60%. Is that going to be enough? No, it's not simply retention. about trying to manage more of a capacity, it's managing it differently. That's what we need to do. Um, I was listening to some of the stories of your viewers coming in about people who have been waiting for ambulances, and as a clinician, your heart sinks to hear that. Mm. It's not simply a case of let's do more. We've got to do it differently. We've got to look at the type of people that are using ambulance services and actually how can we manage this workload differently so we can protect that 5% of the 999 calls that truly need that ambulance in that eight minutes because they have a life-threatening emergency. Okay, so how would you manage it differently, then, Jonathan? If you were running the ambulance service services in England and Wales, what would you do differently? You start to have to manage your resources more effectively and not simply send them out when a call comes in. So what does that mean in practical terms? In practical a call comes in, what would change? In practical terms, we need to ensure that for those calls that are not life-threatening, we need to have the ambulance services have the autonomy to say we are not going to send on those because if we don't not if we don't if we continue as we are we're going to get a situation where our response times for those people in most need are continue are going to continue to drop and they are with category A calls at around 67% as a continual drop because the demand on 999 services is continuing to grow Matthew West thought part of the answer is more people ringing 111 well, I mean, I think for the ambulance service to just be with <laughs> cherry picking, if you like, or, or picking the, the, the life threatening calls only, is uh, it's a bit misguided because the ambulance service is not simply there for the life threatening emergencies. Since 2005, in the um, taking health um, healthcare to the patient in the Bradley report, it was discussed the idea of of the ambulance service being a more holistic provider of pre hospital healthcare. So I think there's a bit of a um, an identity crisis going on within the ambulance service and a bit of 
backpedalling al almost, where they are now being expected only to deal with the life-threatening emergencies. Well, maybe, maybe, that, maybe that is the way forward. Only because it's a necessity due to lack of resources. The ambulance service is best positioned to provide a much broader level of service, which was identified back in 2005, but sadly the funding has never been made available. So the crews on the front line are now expected to deliver more for less on a year-by-year -year basis, and uh, they're stretched beyond their means. Jonathan, do you... Sorry, Martin, do you think the ambulance service should be just for life-threatening? emergencies? I think we're way beyond that and I wouldn't agree with only going to life-threatening emergencies. I think ambulance services provide that level of care very well and continue to do so but it's about working with A&E's GP services to provide more options for care in the community. People don't want to go to A&E if they don't have to. And your video before this interview showed uh, Specialist Paramedic Georgette, you know, providing that extra level of care. Mm. If we can manage more people at home and not take them to the A&E, ambulances don't get tied up by a busy A&E departments and then they're available to answer the life-threatening calls. Thank you very much, all of you. Thanks for coming on the programme. Cheers.